to get rolling again here in just a moment. Again, hello to everybody. Uh, I've talked to many of you, I think, over the last day and a half here. My name is Jason Hanley from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and it's a real pleasure to be here uh, with the Ponderosa Stomp again. Always an amazing time down here in New Orleans and incredible music history that we have here at the conference. And everyone looking forward to some good music tonight? Yeah. All right. Me too. I can't wait. Uh, so we'll uh, get the next panel started off here. It's a real pleasure to have Charles Keep a Knockin' Connor uh, with us today. Charles, of course, played with Little Richard for many years. Made the choo-choo train rhythm really popular in rock and roll back in the day, and I'm sure you guys will talk a little bit about that. And uh, interviewing him again is another stomp regular here, David Cunion. So David and Charles. Uh, okay. Um, <coughs> how you feeling? Feel great, man. You look good too. Yeah, thank you. you look great yourself. Yeah, trying, you know. <laughs> Rami, I was pressing a little bit. <laughs> um, I guess I wanted to. Um, I'll just start kind of from the beginning. Um, how did you first start playing music? Well, I tell you, I was born six ten Dolphine Street in the front quarter. I walk by that all the time. Yeah, and what happened when my mother was pregnant? Every time she would hear music, uh, every time she passed around a band like the Second Line Band, Dixieland Band, and stuff like that, uh, she said, I would jump in her stomach. <laughs> and she said that uh, this baby, because she didn't know what those days, this baby going to be a dancer or a singer or, or whatever. But when I was about five years old, we were living at 16 Dolphin Street. And I used to get, go in the kitchen back there and beat on my mother red bean and gumbo pot, the five gallon <laughs> gumbo pot and the red bean pot. So I'm beating on the pot, you know. And my daddy is black Spanish from San Jose Mango, so he started dancing up in the kitchen. And he told my mother, Charles got talent. Now, when I was about five years old, my father uh, bought me a set of drums when I was five years old from World Line Music Store on Canal Street, uh, right down the street, a half a block or a block from uh, Bourbon Street. Mm -hmm. And that's how I started playing drums, you know. But when I was about 10 years old, I started taking drum lessons. Who was your drum teacher? Uh, Clyde Curd, a guy I knew on the head of 12-piece band, big orchestra. Right. So I took private lessons from him about two years. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, how did you start playing professionally? Well, I thought playing my, I was playing 13 and 14 years old, a little jive gig around New Orleans for a little birthday party. But my first professional job was Roy Bud, Professor Longhair. You ever heard of Professor Oh, really? Oh, yes. oh yeah. Professor Longhead turned out a lot of great drummers, man. Earl Palmer and a lot of guys, you know. And uh, so one day, Mardi Gras day in 1950, the drummer that was playing Professor Longhead, what happened was uh, he got drunk. He celebrated Mardi Gras too early. <laughs> <laughs> That's never happened to me. No, 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 no. <laughs> so what happened is, he, well, we need a drummer for, to uh, replace uh, Bob, you know. And so what happened, they said, well, let's go by Charlie's house. He stay on Bienville and Taunty at New Orleans. Mm. And uh, they came and got me. And what happened was, uh, see, Professor Longhead, I said, man, I was trembling. I can't play with the professor. That guy, man, is powerful. But <laughs> Professor Longhead turned out a lot of great drummers. So what happened? Went to the place, and uh, Professor Longhead looked at me and said, boy, you know my numbers? Big glass eye. Professor used to wear, he smoked a lot of weed. Yeah. <laughs> A lot. <laughs> and I said, I said, yes, I'm Mr. Mr. Longhead. Yeah, yes, sir. Boy, I was so damn nervous, man. Look, I had my, my hand on the, my sticks on the snare drum. I would tremble like that. <laughs> I would tremble just like that. He said, okay, my first number gonna be, uh, I'm going to New Orleans, Mardi Gras song. I said, yes, sir. I was scared, man. So he started off, and I said, wait a minute, Professor. I know a lot of drummers play it with you, but they play with their brushes. Can I please play with my drumstick? I can sound more loud. He said, well, the rest of the drummer played with brushes with who you think you are. And I got musky. <laughs> I really got free of them, man, you know. And he said, all right, go and play with your brushes. And so he started singing, well, I'm going to New Orleans. I want to see the Mardi Gras. 
Well, I'm going to New Orleans. I want to see the Mardi Gras. And when we got to about the 16th bar of the song, he looked at me and he smiled with them big bug teeth in that glassy eye, and he winked. Oh, man, I got sad to them. My confidence grew. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you, you know, but um, that was my first gig, professional gig. First professional yeah. gig. Mm -hmm. And am I right, Professor Long here did not only kind of straight into the very Caribbean the Caribbean style, stuff. yeah. Yeah. He had what the musician call now is, I guess them too, kind of point, all kind of mix of rumbles and congos and, and dixielads and rhythm, all this stuff was uh, mixed up, but it was a hell of a rhythm, man, you know. When you, were, when you were coming up in New Orleans, what was the kind of milieu and the atmosphere of playing music in New Orleans like at that point? Well, I used to go look at the uh, sneak on Bourbon Street, my mother didn't know, and listen to the jazz band, guys, jazz band, Dixieland jazz. Dixieland was cool those days, you know. But uh, I said, no, I need, need something better than this. Dixie, always willing to try something different. I always wanted to be different. My parents say, you got to be different in this world for to be recognized. And you got to have your own style of playing so people can recognize when you're playing. But I, I like the Dixieland. I, was, I used to listen to uh, Buddy Rich, Gene Cooper, mm -hmm. Cozy Cole, and all those guys. And, uh, and Max Roach and all of, you know. But it didn't satisfy me. I didn't want to copy off, off those guys, you know. I wanted my own style. And so finally, I went on a road with a group named Shirley and Lee. Come mm -hmm. on, baby, let's good time road. Go. That was this big hit. So we was doing bad in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, we was playing a club next door to where little Richie was playing. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what happened was we had about 16 people in our club, including the band and the waitress and the bouncer. <laughs> and what happened was uh, he sent his guitar player, Richard had about 200 people. He was playing at the club New Era. He had about 200 people, and uh, he sent his guitar player for the come check us out, me and the saxophone player out. And he said that, uh, yeah, no. Guy pretty good. So Richard came himself. I didn't know the man or woman. I seen somebody stuck the head in the door with all their hair on his head. I didn't know what the hell I was looking at. <laughs> but it was little Richard. And Richard told the third night, he told Richard for to uh, uh, tell us to come to the Y M C A in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, went there and everything like that. And uh, I said, hey, you guy from New Orleans. Yeah, we from New Orleans. I like the way you play. Cause we had checked out. I was auditioning. I knew I was being auditioned. And uh, he said, I like the way you guys play. I'd like to bring you back to uh, Macon, Georgia, and create a band called The Upsetter, Little Rich and His Upsetter, you know, mm -hmm. 1953. I was 18 years old, you know. And I said, yeah, Richard, but uh, uh, my confidence was bad. I said, I don't think you're going to be bothered. I mean, some great thing can happen to you the worst time in your life. I said, yeah, I said, but, you know, we ain't been playing too many gigs. I'm three weeks behind in my hotel room. My drums in a pawn shop, because the drum that I was playing with, that belonged to the club, you mm -hmm. understand? And I said, we had, I had a decent meal in uh, three or four days. And you know, Richard, okay, honey, I'll take care. <laughs> 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 and he did. So he brought us back to Macon, Georgia, and he said, Charles, I want, you, I want a band called The Upsetters, and I want you guys to be different. He said that uh, you got to be different from other people. He said, now what are we going to do now? He said, he said, you know I'm gay. Yeah, we know you're gay. <laughs> <laughs> kind of figured that out. <laughs> <coughs> Nothing wrong with being gay, because yeah, I know a lot of you, great you, 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 A lot of my friends are gay. And the thing about that, he said that, uh, you know I'm gay now. I want you guys to dress with tight pants. So your private can be, all due respect to ladies. <laughs> so your private can be showing out and everything like that. You have tight pants. And I want you guys to act feminine. Like, now practice, how, how, how would you say hi, Charles, and you all, you know, just if you meet, talk to people and I say hi. He said, no, you don't have it right. You gotta be a little more feminine than that. I said, he, he said, you gotta say like, hi. <laughs> He said, no, you got to make your voice more, more, more like a woman, family. I said, okay, hi. He said, Charles, you, you, but that, but you that's all right, you got you know. <laughs> and he said that I want you guys to wear pancake makeup 
and put a little rouge on your feet. I said, what the hell? Is <laughs> Donkey your mustache and all that jazz. And he said that, uh, and I want you to get your hair curled. I had a pretty nice hair. Excuse But he said, I want you to get your hair curled. And so we got our hair curled. He said, I want you to dip. He said, now I'm gay. He said, but my lyrics is not, uh, is not threatening. Yeah. My lyric, you know, like long, tall, Sally and good golly, Miss Molly and Tootie Fruity and all that. Uh, I don't want the Tootie, you want me to tell you a real, real story about Tootie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell her, yeah, yeah. Since we're talking about it. The real story. Respect me, lady. I'll do respect. We only can play Tootie Fruity up in the nightclubs, you know, where there was adults. Now, here it comes, original lyrics to the fruity. It was to the fruity, good booty. If it's tight, it's all right. If it's greasy, it make it easy. <laughs> that's, 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 that's the original, uh, uh, that's the original, but we couldn't record it like that, you know. <laughs> they were ran nope. out of time. Not Go even on. now could you probably oh, you do anything. Like no, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the thing about that, uh, uh, so, but the thing, uh, 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 but you know, tutti frutti gun, fruity fruity, blah, 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 and, and but the wah ba ba loo I've created that like this. I play on it. Wah ba ba loo bop, wah ba ba kick drum, boom. You know, I created that, you know, that sound and everything. So uh, when Richard, uh, he said, I want to tell him, I want to bring you to the train station. You know, I, I was playing this beer anyway before I met Richard, because those days, we couldn't afford, with Shirley, we couldn't afford a bass player, and he didn't want no upright bass player. He just wanted an uh, electric bass player, you know, doom, 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 you know, playing with soul and all that kind of stuff. So what happened was, he said, I'm going to bring you to a train station. I said, what the hell are you going He said, I didn't want you, Charles, to go to the train station with me. I said, what the hell are you going to bring me to the train station by myself? He came, what about the rest of the guys? He said, no, I want you to go to the train station. Okay, okay, Richard. So he picked me up. He had an old pack of 1940. This before he made it big. Okay. He was doing good then. Uh, uh, 1945 pack, old pack. It looked pretty nice pack of cars. So he drove me to the train station. And he said, Charles, watch this train. Listen to this train. And the train pulled off. He said, Charles, what kind of notes are those? I said, Richard, those are eight notes. One and two and three and four and three and four and one. That's where Richard music was created, because he was doing the same thing on the piano. Good guy, let me think, 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 think. I'm playing it and he playing it. You know, the, the eight note, and that covered everything. Now, I uh, created that beat in 1953. Millions and thousands of drummers playing that beat today. The they don't know where the original is from. No, that, that's, that's why you're here. They don't know where the original is from. Yeah. They don't know where the original And I know that beat was contagious with a drug, because that's easy. But you know where I got it from? I got it from years ago. I mean, maybe 50, 60, maybe 102 years. You know where they come from? Where? You call your mama or your dad, mama, papa, mama, papa, mama, papa, mama, papa, mama. Papa, Mama, Papa, and I know it was addicted. And I mean, you uh, now John Bottom, he did and true, he did a pretty good job. But John Bottom, great drummer from Led Zeppelin, huh? John Bottom from Led Zeppelin. Yeah, yeah. John Bottom. But John, ba see that's the attitude. He, he, you know, he played uh, like the keeper knocking, like I created the uh, keeper knocking. Keep on knocking, but John Bottom did that, but he wasn't funky enough. <laughs> no. He didn't have the red bean and rice and cornbread and sun fried chicken. <laughs> no. He tried. You know? He tried. But he tried. He was more technical. He was more technical yeah. and everything like that. But, you know, my, my drumming is uh, I watch people walk on the street and think it's the attitude, just like the. It's an attitude. When I play, it's an attitude. And I know, I know that beat was contagious, man. How, how did you come up with the keep a knocking beat well, in the intro? Well, 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 well. Um, we were playing at the Howard Theater. And uh, 
Rich had said, oh, we only got about an hour and a half. We, we played three shows at the Howard Theater up in uh, Washington, D.C. He said, we only got three hours for the, uh, uh, two and a half hours, or two hours for the do that between breaks. We're going to record a little small studio, a little, little, little larger than a telephone booth, well, a larger than a telephone booth. But uh, he said, I want you all to, uh, uh, to come up with, uh, uh, with, with, with keeping up. And, and we went to the studio, and what happened was he said that, uh, uh, I'm gonna try a three. Uh, I'm gonna try the four ball uh, ghetto intro. So the ghetto went up there. He thought he was cool, but I'm thinking, man. I'm thinking. I said, this is my time for to explode and for me to be noticed, you know. <laughs> and uh, the ghetto playing. Da -da 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 -da. And Rich said, no, that don't sound great. And then Richie got on the piano. Da -da -da -da. Did a little little funky beat on the piano and stuff like that. And so the bass player. Da -da -da. I said, Richie, wait a hold up, hold up. And I know that. And I had that confidence. I knew that. I said, let's do a four-bar drum intro. This is the first four-bar intro on a rock and roll record. So I came up with And no one had ever done that before. No one ever did that before. No one. Could they say it was too simple? Just like a lot of those guys didn't want to play backbeats. This is a backbeat was too mm -hmm. simple. Now, and the way I started playing, uh, uh, the way I, you see, I always wanted to be original. Uh, maybe it's the ego. I don't know what it is, but you gotta be. You got to have an ego to be a musician or an actress or an actor. Do you agree? Yeah. You have to have something different. You know. Yeah. You, you, you know. I mean, you, you you have to have something for the attract people to watch. You got to be different. You know. So what happened was, um, I came up with that, name, and Richard gave me a thousand dollars, a fit ninety fifty seven for that idea. How much did it weigh today? <laughs> That wasn't enough for the way that it's gone. <laughs> really? <laughs> the influence that it's had, that, that was not enough. Right, really. But the thing about that, and, and, and what he did was, uh, so keep a knock and everything. But when I did that, the guy in the control room, that's here, Richard, that you, that you, that you, that you, that And I winked, I said, yeah, I'm going to think, man, you know, <laughs> for using that intro. Mm -hmm. um, how wild was little Richard? We've all heard tales, and was he as wild as everyone says? Little Richard was the, most pretty entertainer that ever walked the face of it. Now, I have played with, not just Little Richard, I played with Little Richard, Sam Cooke, uh, Jan Brown, Jackie Wilson, the original coaster. Richard was the prettiest man, and when he was young, he said, I'm the king and the queen. <laughs> 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 but Richard, <laughs> Richard was one of them. He was a good guy and everything. He was pancake and, and all that stuff. He said, if a guy, if a guy, if you don't, if you're not satisfied my lifestyle, I'll go to the guy in the band. If uh, you're not satisfied my lifestyle, I'll give you a ticket to go home. Because he wanted people to be comfortable around him. And he didn't want people to talk about him and stuff like that. You know? He said, I'm gay and, 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 and the world can do it. But you, who, who did Richard copy after? Being who? Billy Wright. Who? Billy yeah, Wright. oh, that was Billy. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, some <laughs> Billy Wright was in Billy Wright was in Atlanta, Georgia, but 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 he really copied off, and I think Billy Wright too copied off. Yeah, uh, 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 what his name is? Uh, Escarita. No, Escarita, local uh, guy. Yeah. I think the guy that died. What his name is? Uh, uh, not gorgeous, George. The other guy that played the piano. Liberace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> With all of that's well, like, everybody has to copy of somebody originated from somebody. Yeah. And Liberace. Yeah, you know, we didn't find Liberace was gay until you know. Right. But he, you know, we uh, he had those uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the glass thing. Mm -hmm. He loved little Liberace. You know, <laughs> some people say it, and you guys are not old enough. Though. Some people, you remember, you know, you remember gorgeous George. I know who he was. The rascal. Yeah, yeah. He was. Great guy, right. but he, he was more masculine than yeah. little Roger, you know, and his brother George. Remember his brother yeah. George? I mean, you heard him. But the thing about that, that was one of his idols. Now, Billy Wright, he, uh, he liked Billy Wright, and Billy Wright used to give him uh, good advice and everything like that. <coughs> but he said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be bigger than Billy Wright one of these days. <laughs> Billy Wright was tall and everything, you know. And, Nicely, but he never he, not, he he was known around the South, around Georgia, and then he was the king of uh, of uh, Atlanta, Georgia, yeah. you know. But Richard, you know, had a lot of guts, man. Now you were around on the plane trip that caused Little Richard to retire, right? Weren't you around at that oh, point? Oh yeah. Like, tell tell that story. <laughs> you want me to tell it? 
Yeah. I'm going to tell it like it is. All right. That's why. That's what I want to hear. I ain't going to lie about it. I'm going to tell it <laughs> like it is. Because I was there, and I was glad I experienced it. We didn't. In 1957, we had just left Honolulu, and we was going to Australia. But those days, it was a four-engine plane, and we had to feud up in, in Wake Island or Fiji Island. And on, on our way, after we left Fiji Island, uh, the, uh, what happened was, I looked, I looked out the left wing, for the, the left motor, two motor on each side. And I said, now we left Honolulu and it was nighttime. What in the hell is the sun doing shining? The sun wasn't shining, the, the one of the engines on fire. <laughs> oh, jeez. One of the engines on fire, and that's during the time I, I, I was drinking, you know, I was alcohol, I stopped drinking about 45 years ago, you know. Yeah. No, Stop the drugs and all that stuff. But anyway, the engine was on fire. And uh, Richard said, oh, my goodness, the world is coming to an end. Now, you got to remember, we're talking about Russia now, when Russia launched Sputnik. Remember, y'all read about mm -hmm. Sputnik up in, in space. And he thought, Richard thought that was the end of the world because the plane catching on fire. And Richard said, I tell you one thing, man, I was so scared, man. I almost had to wear pampered or diapers. <laughs> 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 And with that, we got to Australia, and Richard said that this is my, uh, I'm not going to sing rock and roll anymore because the world is coming to an end. I said, Richard, the world is coming to an end. There's, there's people every day, you know, trying to encourage him, you know. And what happened, after we came from Australia, Richard paid us off for a month and a half in advance, money, good money. But I said, oh, my goodness, man. Uh, how are we going to live without little Richard? The girls, the drugs, the alcohol, the luxury living, the privileged living, the hotels, and all that kind of stuff. How are we going to make it? So a guy by the name of Charles Sullivan that owned or he leased the uh, film auditorium, we were playing date for him out here up in uh, the West Coast and uh, Washington, Oregon, play in some parts of Canada. He said, you guys just hold on for about a month. I'm going to pay you guys so much a week. Stick together. I don't, go, no, I don't want to catch you guys playing for nobody else. And uh, he said, I'm going to create an artist for you. So who was the artist that, after Richard came out of show business, who was the artist that took the band over after little Richard came out of show business? And this other guy was going into another, uh, another bit. You know it? No, we had played with Jack. We played with Jan Brown, but uh, it was uh, Sam Cooke. So Sam Cooke took over what had been the upsetters. The upsetters. Yeah. yeah, Sam Cooke took over the uh, liber But Sam Cooke and Sam Cooke was coming out the gospel field, going into the, I guess the pop field. Mm -hmm. Little Richard was coming out the rock and roll and rhythm and blues field. They go into the spiritual field uh, to be a seven-day Adventist, you know. So we played about 15 days with Sam Cooke. Now you know Sam Cooke. I'm playing with drum brushes, you know. Darling, you send me. All that kind of, with brushes, you know. Mm -hmm. Man, it's a damn drag playing. I'm used to bop, bop, <laughs> <laughs> I'm used to playing with drumstick and all that stuff. And Sam said, he said, darling, and he told one of the guys in the band, he said, play a long solo, because this is the only, so, the only, the only song I know. I don't know what the B-side was. So mm -hmm. the guy, uh, he played a, 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 a long solo and everything. But Sam Cooke turned out to be one of the greatest entertainers that walked the face of the earth. But uh, after, I mean, after, you know, because he wasn't used to singing, you know, you know, pop and all that kind of stuff. And... Uh, after Sam Cooke, after we contract ran with Sam Cooke, we started playing with people like Jackie Wilson. A lot of energy there, yeah. you know. Good. Jackie but Wilson, you know, has a certain affinity like Little Richard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He wasn't well quite up. feminine like he, he no. had to look and, and power. You know, the guy used to, be a, used to be a boxer at one time. I heard he that. To, yeah, he used to be a pride. I think his son had performed too, so Jackie Wilson Jr. But anyway, Jackie Wilson, then we started playing behind the coasters and uh, all these... Uh, other groups and stuff like that, you know? But uh, now, back to Sam, back, back to Jan Brown, before Richard made it big, I, I, I was playing like a four, 
the band was playing about four days with uh, Little Richard, like uh, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Jan Brown and Little Richard was booked from the same book legend in Macon, Georgia. And when I played with, when I played with, uh, uh, with Richard, you know, it's cool, and I would moonlight with Jan Brown. Not, that's not bad. That's two good people to be playing with. Oh, yeah, two great people, yeah. And, uh, uh, but what happened was uh, I was playing, one, uh, I was playing one, one night with Jan Brown on a Tuesday night at the VFW club. And I was playing, and what happened, he said that uh, I'm doing a second line beat, the second line, right. making it funky, you know? And what happened was uh, he said, Charles, what the hell are you doing back there? I said, I'm playing a second line beat, making it funky. But this was Jan Brown said about me. Here, you read it. They say that. This from Rolling Stone, uh, 1982, said Charles Connor was the first to put the funk into the rhythm. And for that, the 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 Rolling Stone, uh, uh, that was a uh, 1982, Rolling Stone magazine. Now, what was James Brown like back then versus you know what we all know he became? Did you know he was going to become the kind of can you tell back then he was become kind of the icon that he would become? Well, you see, Rich used to play for, for, for black and white people, mm -hmm. like black and white audience. Jan Brown at that time was only playing for, uh, for uh, black audience. He right. was more of a blues thing. But, you know, there was two kings, and Rich was the bigger king. You know, they were booked by the same, before Richard made a big foot, Jan Brown made a big, they were booked by the same booking agent in Macon, Georgia, a guy by the name of Clint Bradley. <laughs> And so Clint was booking Richard and booking uh, Jan Brown too. And what happened, and they had competition. So uh, <laughs> Jan Brown would say, uh, yeah, I might not be good at previous little Rich, but I can dance better than him. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's true. Yeah. <laughs> no one really danced much better than and, James Brown. And, right, and, and then Richard said, yeah. Uh, 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 I'm Little Richard, and I'm pretty. I'm the prettiest man, prettiest man. And that's, that's when he recorded that song. Baby, dun, 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 dun. don't you want a man like me? And Richard recorded that song. <laughs> don't you want a man like me? He was, he was really something else, man, you know. But him and Jan Brown, now, when Richard came, you know, we've been in three movies. The Girl Can't Help with Jan Manfield. Mm -hmm. Jan Manfield loved Little Richard. And, uh, and uh, Mr. Rock and Roll. And the girl can't help. The girl can't help with the first Technicolor movie. Right. I say it was the first video movie. Yeah, 1957. 50, 50. And what happened was, uh, uh, re, uh, up in the, the movies and everything like that, we were so proud, man. You, 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 you know, it was something different because musicians, man, in a movie. That wasn't and happening a lot. Yeah, and you, and you see people, I mean, people are looking, oh, that guy in the movie, you say, man, you feel so proud. Kind of boosts your ego up a little bit. <laughs> but anyway, it was something, man. You know, you, you know you're you playing a movie, guys, oh, that's the guy, oh, that's the guy seeing the movie, such as a man, you know. And uh, we were the first band that dealt with the fast down on Chuck Berry. And, uh, oh, by the way, uh, about, right, Queen, about uh, my daughter, Queen, she's my uh, personal manager. Uh, I received my Lifetime Achievement Award for ND Entertainment, me, Little Rich, and Chuck Berry, about a month and a half ago, two months ago. So I received it. Yeah. Wow. Um, we got a little bit more time, um, we got, uh, but do we have any uh, questions for Mr. Connor, anybody? Um, microphone is coming around, so. Uh, when you worked with uh, Sam Cooke, did he do any recordings with uh, Sam Cooke? Richard? Sam Cooke. Sam Cook. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 yeah. He didn't play on any of the records? No, he just, uh, Sam Cooke had certain tunes, but no, uh, he didn't do any recording. Yeah. So you just, you just played with him in gigs no, and yeah, stuff, we but yeah, not, yeah, yeah, yeah. not in the recording yeah. studio? The studio band, he used to use studio bands and stuff like that, you know. Okay. Uh, over uh,
Okay, did, didn't Earl Palmer also play with Little Richard? And were, did you all split the recordings? Were you on some of them and he was on some yeah, of them? Yeah, such as that. Now let me tell you something about that. I'm Little Richard, original drummer. Earl started playing with Richard in 1955. Uh -huh. did it, those guys were trained studio musicians, good musicians, but they didn't want to play rock and roll. They say, because the bat you so simple. Now, Earl Palmer didn't want yeah, to? Yeah, they didn't want to play. Uh, Earl Palmer and Lee Allen and all those guys, they didn't want to play rock and roll, but they, they had to uh, record rock and roll because they was family man, two and three different yeah. kids and stuff like to that. Support yeah. themselves. Yeah. yeah, but, and the thing, but the, a lot of things that Earl played on, you know, I used to go in the studio, I said, no, Richard wants that. You want that choo-choo train beat one and two and three. He said, yeah, but you know, and you can't you all go to God, you gotta respect, he was master, one of the master of drummer. But a lot of time, I would go in the studio and say, man, this is the way Richard wanted, you know? And then they say, especially the record said that, uh, oh, why don't we use some of the studio musicians? The studio music, you can't call the studio musician little Richard and stuff. Some of the guys 34 and 35 years old, they're yeah. young cats, man with energy and stuff, you know. Well, no, when I, when you're, you're right, when I talked to, you know, I met Earl and knew him, and he, you know, he was, wanted to play jazz yeah, yeah. more than he wanted to play kind of rock and roll, and yeah, that yeah, was kind yeah. of what paid the bills. Yeah, 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 when you can't blame a guy, yeah. and I think they were going to GI school and doing records and everything like that. They had yeah, family and stuff like that, but they didn't want to play, they, 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 I ain't calling them, some of the guys in the studio used to make fun of Richard Man and say, what in the hell is that, a man or a woman? You know, and that's not right, man. He, Richard didn't make it soft. I mean, come on, man, give me a break, you know. But they used to make fun of him and all that stuff, you know. But, oh, let me tell you one, one thing. Uh, when, we, when we did the movie, the girls came, when Richard came out here to do the screen test, what happened was uh, he had the a screen test for the girl can't help. Yeah, girl can't. Okay. He had about 10 dates, 10 dates left. And Clint Bradley had to correct, collect the uh, deposit on the date. He said, when can, who can I use and Richard play? Because Rich was out there in, in, in Los Angeles. Who, think, who, who pulled those dates for little Richard? Dan Brown. <laughs> <laughs> Dan Brown. And so what happened was, uh, so Dan Brown, he said, man, a great plan with you guys and everything. So I said, and when Richard made it big, he, Richard made it big before him. R uh, Jan Brown told me, he said, man, Charles, I, would, I never had no problem with Jan Brown. A lot of musicians had problems. I never had a bit of no problem with There are books and books about the musicians. Yeah, yeah. No problem and, with right. and what happened, he said, Charles, if you come on a roll with me, this name, your price. I said, man, Jan, with all due respect, I can't go on a roll with you. I said, could Richard help me when I didn't have a thing to thing in the bay? I said, I got to respect Richard. So that's why I stuck with Richard, you know. Other questions? Yeah, we got it. we're recording. So. Do, you, do you remember the recordings that you guys did, the instrumentals for Bobby Robinson on Fire Fury? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Tell us how did that come about? Was it? How, how did, did that the, how happen? How did the recordings you did for Fire and Fury for uh, Bobby Robinson come about? Oh, uh, just a good recording and everything like that, you know, yeah. How, how, did, how did you get, how did you meet him? How did those come about? Oh, uh, uh. How, did, how did the, what were the circumstances? Well, who? For the Bobby Robinson Fire and Fury instrumentals. Oh, I don't know, man. I, I don't know anything about that. Okay. Yeah, I don't know anything about that. Okay. Wait, five? For for Bobby Robin Bobby Robinson. Yeah. You did some recording for him. Yeah, we just recorded for special records. Okay. Special records. Oh, Roots. Are those are those the ones you were. Uh, uh, jaywalking and uh, other stuff that was on Fire and Fury records. No, I wasn't on none of those records. Okay. No, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> um, anybody? Yeah. Uh, hi, I was listening to a cut um, by that was credited to D. Clark and the Upsetters, and it's on a Cosmo collection. And I was wondering if you were on that track yeah. and. Um, if you did others, it sounds like from your description, like when Little Richard retired, you went immediately on the road, but yeah. were you in town and were you doing sessions for D. Clark and other people as well? Yeah, but we did record, well, yeah, that's another guy we played by, D. Clark. He tried to be like Little Richard. Tried to act like Little Richard. We, 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 I forgot the song, 24 Bars and whatever. 
with D. Claw, and we also re record with uh, Don Covey. Okay. Yeah, Don Covey. We record with him in Washington, D.C. Were you doing a lot of sessions once? Richard well, we do a little, spot, little, little, spot, little, little spot session and stuff like that. Don okay. Covey and D. Claw. I think D. Claw was on our specialty records, I think. Were you living? Were you living in New Orleans at that time, or you were in Los Angeles? No, we, uh, in, in uh, Los Angeles. Los Angeles. Yeah, because okay. he tried to get a uh, uh, Art Root tried to replace him with a little Ricky. He said, "Richard, D. Clark, man, he's gonna be another little Ricky. He's gonna be another little Ricky, but he was great and everything." And he said that, uh, you know, come aboard, man, because uh, what's happening is uh, I'm gonna make him out another little Richard. Richard said, "I don't care," because <laughs> <laughs> Richard would come out of show business anyway. So, yeah. Right. Nothing was going to put Richard back in no, at that yeah. point. Hey, only, only one little Richard, man. You know, be out there, Gus, to be a little Richard, nerve and Gus, yeah. and be crazy and everything like Especially that. Especially back. Well, that was, was there was besides Billy Wright. Was there anybody else out there like a little Richard, even no, close to little Billy Richard? Billy Wright was the closest one. Yeah. Billy Wright. Oh, Escarita. But uh, Escarita came yeah, out yeah, a little yeah, later. But, uh, yeah. yeah. But, but one thing, about he uh, he he helped Richard. Piano. He showed Rick how to play different chords on a piano. Escarita did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, Charles Connor, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> <And by coughs> Thank you. Thank you. And, and by the way, by the way, I have books out there. I got a book about my life on the road and everything. I got another book. Uh, uh, Nam, don't, I'm a publisher, I'm an author mm -hmm. too. Don't give up your dream, you could be a winner too. I'm selling them out there, my drumstick, my t-shirt and everything out in the lobby there. All right. Don't give up your dream and a third of a legendary drummer. Thank you. Yeah. Give me one of your cards. Hmm? Um, 